welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. I'm really excited to have our guest on today, Robert Wheeler, CEO of Mission Clarity. Robert, we all need clarity and we all need mission. This is going to be fabulous. I'm so excited to be here today talking about my favorite topic. Awesome. Well, we are excited to have you on. Uh, Wendy F. Adams, CFRE. Yay. Woman extraordinaire, founder of Cultivate for Good. Um, Wendy, tell us where you are, because you started off in the green room by saying you're supposed to be in two places at one time. So I'm still in Lynchburg, Virginia, just not in my home studio because I've got to be someplace right after. But you can't tell. It's all good. No, you're doing great. I mean, you're doing something for our sector. I am doing something for our sector and in, in leadership. So there's a Lynchburg leadership um, seminar, seminar and summit that's happening right after. And I get a chance to be able to, to share a little bit of my knowledge. So really awesome. excited about it. Congratulations. Well, Thanks. we're thrilled that you're here to share your knowledge and your wisdom with us um, because every day with Wendy is a good day uh, for sure. You know, we also have these amazing sponsors and I want to make sure that we give them a shout out. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes on Friday, and your part-time controller these are the folks that join us day in and day out. Most of these people have been with us uh, since we started. Uh, we're now in our fifth year. We've done almost 1,200 episodes. And um, so they really have marched with us uh, along this amazing journey. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Wendy F. Adams, CFRE, co-host extraordinaire, and uh, with Cultivate for Good is on this this amazing show with us today um, as we really think about folks digging out from the South. I mentioned this a couple times during this last week, but both Tony Bell and Meredith Terrian um, live in and work in Florida and uh, Meredith is from Tampa. And oh, yeah. so um, they're all safe and sound, but um, it has been a harrowing couple of weeks. And as yeah, yeah. we all know, the nonprofit sector is called forward at this time. Mm -hmm. When there are times of crisis, man, we get called front and forward and it's tough. And so uh, my compassion and my thoughts go out to these folks. Robert Wheeler, tell us where you're coming to us from. Well, I actually am in the Lynchburg, Virginia area as well. Um, I've actually worked in and around uh, with Wendy for about 12 years now we've known each other um, and we've worked at a couple of different places and we've volunteered at some different places together. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful area and yeah. blessed to be here. It's so exciting. Well, talk to us briefly before we start peppering you with all these questions. Yeah. What is mission clarity? Like, what is it that you all do? Yeah. So you mentioned a second ago, the, um, the hurricane, right. And, yeah. and it, crises have a tendency to bring out the focus for a nonprofit, right? Mm -hmm. When something happens that you didn't expect or something happens that creates uh, trauma or creates that chaos, uh, that's when you have to lean on the part that I bring to the table, which is strategy. How do you decide what is important for your uh, mm -hmm. nonprofit? How do you decide what your marching orders are? Uh, and so that's really what I'm all about is uh, with Mission Clarity, uh, is, is helping nonprofits stay on mission, but then clarifying that mission um, and, and not having to wait until there is a hurricane to clarify what your mission actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's what I do. I come alongside uh, and often bring um, a little bit of calm uh, to the storm, if you will. And um, to kind of to kind of coincide with that, um, my role, I like to, to, to refer to myself as a uh, CMO at your service, right? Not everybody can have a chief marketing officer. A right. lot of people uh, have multiple hats that they need to wear. And so my job is to come alongside, listen. I love to listen. Tell me what your story is, and then I'll help you tell it to the people that you need to get in connection with. I love it. You know, Wendy, have you seen this across the trajectory of your practice in that people don't, maybe they don't really know what their mission is. 
Yeah. And absolutely. That's it. Mm -hmm. They can't even speak it out and it's fumbling through and how do we do? And then we talk about the drift because if you don't know what it is, there's no way to stay on it. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. Isn't that what gets me so excited about today? Well, you know, it is, it is a, a fascinating thing to think about. And I think during this time with these terrible storms that we've had, mm. Um, and we're having storms civically and economically yes. and socially. I mean, it's it's a time of change. Um, and so I think a lot of times it is fascinating that we think we know what our mission is. And I, I would say even in the for-profit world, you know, we think we know what our product is. Right. But sometimes we don't really. It's Or maybe the consumers are driving it in a different direction. Yes. So the first question we have to start with, given that, is, this is like a heartbreaking question to ask. Mm. Mm. I mean, it kind of, I don't even want to ask it, but the notion is, is your nonprofit story even worth telling? It that gives me the X. Yes. Well, and I think the reason why it does is because we often confuse vision with mission. And we often say, oh, we use, we use a, a vision and mission but those are very two very distinct terms right it's usually easy for a nonprofit or nonprofit leader to envision the world that they want to have and to be able to see this is what i want i want to be able to see a place where there's less than x amount of this happening in the world it's easy for us to do that but the okay. hardness comes when we talk about mission what are the steps that you do every day to make that happen Right. And so uh, Seth Godin, who's one of my favorite marketers, right, he has this quote and this is what he says. He says, if you can find an audience of people who, if they were to care about you, if they were to embrace you, if they were to dance with you, it would be sufficient to propel you to the next step. Those are your people. And that's how you know your story's worth telling right? You can see into that future and you can envision that world is, that is to come. But if you have people, if you have those relationships that are willing to dance with you, right? To be able to do that day-to-day -day operational thing and you have that relational relationship equity and you've embraced that empathy that's necessary for that, then you do have a story that's worth telling. Okay. So when I've heard Seth say that, okay, in person, and I think one of the things that he adds to that is that these are not big numbers. Right. And so I think for me, that's kind of like a head shaker because um, a lot of times we think, oh, my God, everybody in the community has got to get on our bandwagon. Everybody has to be marching with us. But no. that may, might not be the case. Right. And, and in fact, if you try to placate the masses, you will lose your ability to do your mission. That yeah. that's that's you're exactly right. That's that's one of Seth's main points. Yeah. Always focus on the smallest possible audience. Yeah, that's that's your core. The people that are, uh, you know, we talked about rallying, right? How do you how do you how do you create that, right? How do you get those people? And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth here in just a couple minutes. That's that's your core, and that's how you know that your mission is worth doing in order to accomplish the vision. And therefore that story is definitely worth telling. Rob, I, so do you, do you get pushback when you, when you bring <laughs> forth <laughs> this concept, like your, your story it's good, but, but not the way that you have it crafted. It, no one's, no one's hearing it. What, what do, do you get that pushback or that whole oh, mission yeah. vision or two different things? What does that response look like? Yeah, you know, so she she just used the terminology, the ick, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why a lot of people kind of feel that that tension, and it's very palpable, like, what? Mm -hmm. Is because <laughs> oftentimes you're talking about somebody's baby, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody yeah. gave birth to this yeah. vision, right? And yeah. and then they they get into this thinking of, my well, my mission and my vision are the same. And helping them separate those two things out can often feel like somebody's trying to separate your child from you because mm. this is my baby. Like, what do you mean? You, you can't tell me how to do this. Um, so there is that pushback. Um, and I think the best way to deal with that pushback is empathy. You have to have a certain amount of relationship equity with somebody to tell them the things that they don't want to hear. 
And that's oftentimes, that's how I know whether I'm going to work with somebody or not work with somebody very well is whether or not they take what I just gave them and they hear, this is something I need to hear. I may not want to hear it, but if, but if they're able to take that and say, you know what, I needed to hear that, then we'll work well together. Wow. That's prophetic, but I love that. I think that's like, I mean, Wendy, I, I think that could even go down the line with the donor relationship. Well, that's exactly it. That's exactly where it's going to flow. And, and, and that transforms how they then are interact and engage. And when we start talking about sustainability and them becoming champions, which we love to speak to that, you know, that word and that'll come, uh, that's where it's birthed. You know, Rob, I'm, I hear you. you. You've now said, this is what's going to determine if somebody is going to be a good fit for you to be able to, to bring that at your service for them. Now that they've determined, yes, I do have a story worth telling. I need help getting there. Mm -hmm. How do you step into the space of having it be the right way that the story is being told? That oh, we are not, yes. we're being authentic. And like I, I like to say versus pathetic or being oh, bold, wow. right? That's that there, there's what's going to draw people in. So I just want to hear, hear what you have to say in that space. So the, the how right? Yes. How do you? Um, and, and so I think everybody has in their mind what they think is the best way to tell their story, right? And so, um, and that sometimes breaks down um, by generations as well, mm -hmm. right? Oh, so you'll yeah. see the millennial and younger generations typically um, push towards more using social media as a platform mm -hmm. to tell that story. Uh, and there's less of that drive to want to that story in person, less of the drive to want to put on an event, right? Um, and so what that really then comes back to is, Seth Godin again, is how do you define that smallest possible audience? So who that audience is that you need to tell the story to drives how you tell it, right? Because there have been times where the best way for a nonprofit to actually tell their story is to drop something in somebody's mailbox, right? It all depends on what the outcome is that's expected versus who it's being presented to, right? And you have to kind of weigh those two things together. You guys know this. You've been in fundraising for as long as I can remember, Wendy, right? So, so there's this, how do you get somebody to embrace it in the best possible way, right? And you start measuring all those metrics and it can confuse the issue. But at the end of the day, how do you get those people to dance with you? Mm -hmm. And, and, and it all comes down to where your story needs to be told in order to then accomplish your angle. So you're saying don't focus, well, not don't, but, but first and foremost, don't look for that kiss or cry moment, as we right. would say, like, like look, as Wendy said, I love that. Be authentic, but not pathetic. Um, right. How do we do this? Like, how do we think about this? Because it's such an old school thing. I mean, I can think back, you know, as a young woman, I'm um, hearing about what they used to call old white man eating from a garbage can, that if you could find an older white male eating from a garbage can, the world was your like philanthropic oyster. That's because amazing. people would say in America, that shouldn't happen. And right. then it was, it was like a demographic cue um, and a lot of times these images would no more relate to the nonprofit than the man on the moon, but they were used to steward a type of response. And I see it, you know, in, in what we're talking about here, you're, you're, you're right on the, on the edge of a knife. You're on a, that fine line, right? How do you stay authentic? How do you stay vulnerable without drifting over into becoming that victim? And yeah and trying to, to get the bleeding hearts, right? And, mm -hmm. and get people to respond to your story in a way that is the, the tear jerk moment. And I think what it really comes down to is authenticity. Um, and whenever you do portray yourself as vulnerable without being a victim, you breed collaboration. People want mm -hmm. to collaborate with you. But when you drift into that victimhood instead, you start to breed competition 
right? Mm. And so in this, in this nonprofit world, the more that we can find ways to intersect our stories, maybe with somebody else's story in an authentic way, and you allow them to also tell their story in the space that you've created, well, now you've, you've gone back towards collaboration. And that's, mm -hmm. I think that's the key to authenticity. Let me ask a follow-up question to Wendy's comment, and that is, how data heavy, heavy should we be? It seems like this uh, newer, or not newer, but next generation of donors are so impact-oriented, um, and their charitable nature is much more oriented towards solutions, and we use the word impact. Um, if you have a choice between emotion and data, what do you advise? So my advice is always know your numbers. You have to know your numbers. You have to know what your impact is. But the second that you remove emotion from those numbers, those numbers have no meaning then because you can take those numbers to mean whatever you want then. So you have to find a way to take that, um, that, that very palpable impact of, hey, there are, let's say, 100 people who are underserved and they need something to eat, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can take that and that has a number to it. But if you don't also tie in some kind of a collaborative emotion that says, hey, wait a second, they need a meal, but what they really need is they need to have some kind of a sustainable relationship that comes alongside of them that helps them to then step out of their own victimhood mm. and step into their own uh, wanting to wanting to be vulnerable, but also be their own hero. Well, that's how then you you give the right type of emotion to those numbers. Um, and I think that's what that's what this generation is looking for is we can all see around us the impacts of the current economy, right? We yeah. see it. It's palpable. It's it's right in front of us. But in order to then actually drive a response, those emotions have to be tied to the numbers. Likewise, the numbers have to be tied to the emotion. And, and it, you, you drive that tricky line of don't make things mean what they shouldn't mean, right? <laughs> don't, don't take that mm -hmm. and make it mean something else, which is very easy for us to want to do because we, we get so focused on that vision. Well, yeah. this is what we want with the world. Don't forget your mission always come back and remember, no, no, no. These are the day-to-day -day activities I must do in order to get that. So yeah. Wendy, go ahead. I have, I'm like well, my head. I just, well, I'm thinking there's the vehicle and then there's the engine and they, they both need like, so what do we, you know, what's driving? But if, if we don't have the vehicle of here's the data, this is what is really happening. And then I feel like the, the emotional and the, the making it your own in that story is the engine that moves us forward. Yes. It's a perfect analogy, Wendy. Perfect analogy. Yeah. You know, Wendy, I love that because it also um, makes the donor the hero of the story at the same time, right? Yeah. Um, I think that there's so much, Rob, what you said was pretty magical. And that is, you know, we want to see people not just fed, but we want them to be able to feed themselves and their families. And how do we navigate to a bigger solution? Um, and so I think this is part of a new way of looking at things, right? As opposed to just like, oh yeah, we'll take care of you versus, you know, we'll nurture you and, and look for bigger, mm -hmm. uh, bigger solutions. And this is a, it's somewhat of a change in, in society. It, it navigates us away from I think judgment in some ways and, and being more um, upstream. Yeah. Upstream. That's a good word. I like that. That's a, a, a good word. Okay. So the two of you have g given us a lot to think about and in the remaining moments that we have, how do we get more of you, right? Like, okay. How do we recruit folks to join us, tell a similar story, or maybe I should say accurate story, right? Um, and how do we do that so that then the story can be authentic? So I'm thinking about, you know, our board members. I'm thinking about our staff. 
You know, I'm thinking about stakeholders, even clients. Like, how do we get everybody rowing in the same direction? I think you need to provide a space that you can hear their story in. You have to provide a comfortable space for them to be authentic in, for them to be vulnerable in, right? So you're, you're going to have those initial people, right? Your, your first ambassadors, if you will, who rally around whatever this vision is that you have put out into the ethos. And then you start to kind of develop that, okay, well, what's my mission going to be on a day-to-day -day basis? And so you have that initial band of followers, right? If you don't give them the capacity in, in your own day, in yourself, and the, and the actual um, place and safety to also tell their story back to you, they're going, they're going to drift away because they don't see a place where their story gets to be told within your story. Um, and, and that's where if you focus too much on your story, you drift into becoming that, that victim, right? As opposed to being vulnerable has to be a two way street. If you don't allow for that two way conversation to happen. And that's, I mean, that's why we do donor events, right? That's why we bring them into a room. Um, but we have to be careful that we are not so heavy focused on our own story in their room that we miss out on theirs because then we miss out on creating that relationship with them, which as Wendy will tell you, if you don't create a relationship with somebody, how are you going to cultivate the ask? How are they going to navigate to a place where they feel safe enough to not only just look at your numbers and your impact and the emotions that come along with that, but know, hey, there's safety here, especially yeah. this new generation. They need that safety. They're craving that from us. Okay. Julia, you always bring to the forefront, I love it, employees, and you obviously write in with the board members as well, right? Key stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Rob, you said create a space for them, right? For that right. to happen. But but right up front expectations, right? It's in the name, clarity. No yeah. one's gonna champion something that they don't understand, that they, yeah. they, they can't put their hands around to be even right. able to have that space and create a story. So expectations up front, you wanna work here? This is what it looks like. This is gonna be a part of, for you to be able to, to speak out an ambassador. Hey, board member, it's not just three times a year or once a month that we're going to meet. You're going to be a champion of this. So let, let's let's give you an opportunity to be in the space that you have your own story to tell. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, that those are the things that get me so fired up. Yes. So, Wendy, I love what you said. But then I'm thinking back about, like, everybody needs to learn the elevator speech, right? Yep. That sense that we, we all need to be able to literally – if we're in an elevator and we only have 15 floors to go down, how do we communicate, you know, what we're doing? How does this differ? Because when you have the elevator pitch, it's not very uh, authentic or unique. I always say there's, there's the tone, but it's got to be in your voice. So we all have the same tone, okay. but in your voice, we okay. don't differ. And that's, that's my elevator. Right. And then when we jump off or we're about to, I love when someone says, man, I want to know more about that. That's when, you know, we exchange or whatever. And we can then get into the fact of, hey, let me tell you mine. But but it's it's in in our voice. And mm -hmm. that's what makes it authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that, Wendy. I, you know what, what it really what it really then creates in in them is the opportunity to make it their own. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're they're not going to do that. They're not going to hop on that elevator with you and tell you about this organization that they're a part of if they haven't been given the time and space from that organization mm -hmm. to tell their story. And and I think there's that cultivation that needs to happen too. Not everybody's comfortable with that elevator speech. They're not yeah. just gonna, they're not just gonna regurgitate it right there. Yeah they need to be provided a space where they can go to and talk a little bit about their own story and practice themselves. And I think more donor events that are focused on that, especially for board members. I mean, Wendy is like the board member developer extraordinaire, right? Creating that space where a board member can talk about their story develops their voice, develops mm -hmm. that and gives you a two-edged sword 
you've helped them develop their voice, which helps them as a person, but they've interacted with you and learned your tone. And I think that's the, it, I, I, it's incredibly undervalued in the nonprofit world to spend that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it's, and it's not one to many, that's more of a one to one, maybe one to two or three or four, you know, and kind of creating that smaller group. But I'm telling you, those ambassadors, those are the ones that are going to dance with you that Seth is talking about. Those are the ones that are going to, they're going to lock shields with you and they're going to go get that mission with you every day. Mm -hmm. Wendy, when you have done this, is this a one and done thing or does this need to be re-upped every year or, or give us in the few moments we have left, like how do we as a nonprofit actually bring people that are rushing in, rushing out, you know, doing different things with their lives and then try and get them up to speed on this. What does that look like? Well, it looks like what you, it's not a one and done. And, and, okay. and we know this, we know this as we're interacting with our donors and our board, it's gotta be a built in part of every interaction that we have. That doesn't mean it has to be long and laborious, but there's gotta be that opportunity in a board meeting in that agenda that says, who's got a story to tell. What did that look like when when you had, you know, and giving them even those opportunities to write thank you notes, you know, pick up the phone. I love the meaningful engagement plan that that's an expectation piece right off the bat that I do with all of my board training, because it says this is who I am. This is my voice. This is how I would like to step out. What has to be done? The expectation is you're going to interact and engage with donors. Oh, no, I'm not a fundraiser. I need you to tell your story. But we've got to create those spaces. And so it's, it is that cultivating over and over and giving them those spaces to do it because it looks different for each. Yes. Yes. It, it, it's interesting, Rob. It seems to me like it's also a confidence issue. Like mm. maybe like what Wendy just said, that that board member that says, or even somebody in the C-suite that's like, you know, the CFO, I don't raise money. It's like, yeah, but the culture of philanthropy is alive and well within our organization. We're right. all part of sharing this. How do you see that playing out? Well, I think the second that you can move it away from being a conversation about raising money and mm -hmm. instead a conversation about raising your mission or um, broadcasting your vision, um, people get passionate about that. Money is never going to be the main object for any nonprofit. Do you need it to survive? Yes, you do. But do you need to execute your mission? I would say that's more critical. Money's always going to be there. If you tell your story well, and if you live on mission well, the money will show up. So I think if you change the narrative from telling somebody in the C-suite, hey, you need, to, you need to get out there so we can raise money, and instead say, hey, you've got a story to tell tell your story to me and you cultivate that over time. Oftentimes people get out of college and they get all these letters after their name and they've never practiced telling an elevator speech in mm -hmm. their life. They've never talked mm -hmm. about what drives them. What's their personal mission? Why right. do you do what you do? Is it just to be richer? I'm here to tell you the more money you make, if that's your mindset, the more empty you're going to feel. So I think if you give somebody that that individual power and a place to put their story, the money will take care of itself. Focus instead on here's the safe place where you can tell your story. Why are you here? People don't work at nonprofits because it's a killer salary. I've, I've been there. I've done that. Right. People work there because they believe in the mission. And if you give them the opportunity to tell that story the money takes care of itself. I love it. Well, Rob, you have been amazing. I, I have, Wendy, I've really enjoyed this. Um, it, it, you, you both are me. awesome. You guys oh are God. awesome. Well, Wendy warned me. She's like, you're going to love this guy. We got to get him on. We got to get him on. And uh, so I, I think for me, it, you, you brought forward some a different way to look at something that we we hear these words we bandy mm -hmm. this about we are, we're like we need to be doing this we need to be doing this but the reality is um it's not 
it's not so easy and yet it's very easy right if we if we restructure the way we look at this it's very very easy uh robert wheeler ceo of mission clarity check out their site missionclarity.org um we have a couple comments one that just came in love this very informative uh so thank you very much for that comment uh but you know rob this is such a critical thing mm -hmm. that is a piece of the puzzle for a lot of organizations that if they're missing it um they, they cannot be as successful as they could be and the frustration is just is heartbreaking to yes. see this yes you know? And Very the big good. thing is who loses out are those that we're serving, right? That's exactly we, if right. we don't get this right, that's the biggest loss. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Right, right. I mean, yeah, it's so important. Um, wow. You know, Rob, I'm going to really, I'm going to have to step back and watch this again because you've given me um, a new way to think about this in and uh, I think a, a stronger, more articulate way to look at this. And so thank you so much for coming on. Wendy, my friend, thank you for joining us in a very busy day, um, coming on the nonprofit show and then racing off to do something else and speaking and, and teaching in your community. Um, I am thrilled that you are, are part of this episode for sure, but I'm really thrilled you're a part of the nonprofit show family. You bring so much to all of us. Another thing that is really amazing that sets our table every day are our presenting sponsors and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader fundraisers friday and your part-time controller these people join us day in and day out so we can have these amazing discussions mm -hmm. and uh, i certainly learned a lot and it, i've also felt like i've had some things confirmed right mm -hmm. like why That's do it. we That's do it. these things right and not, but not really knowing like why we should be doing them and how it works. So thank you so much, Wendy F. Adams, CFRE, founder of Cultivate for Good and Rob Wheeler, Mission Clarity. You know, we end each and every episode of the nonprofit show with this mantra and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks everyone. See you back here tomorrow. <laughs>